continue with our study of the early career of Roncalli as being somebody who was catapulted to prominence by Pius XII personally, as we saw, and he was installed as the as the nuncio to France, Pius XII said, I want to make it clear that it was I uh, who acted in this nomination, thought of it, and arranged it all. And that for that reason you may be sure, you being Roncalli, may be sure that the will of God could not be more manifest or encouraging. That's what Pius XII himself said to Angelo Roncalli as Roncalli was being transferred from obscurity, relative obscurity, in Istanbul to Paris. So, well, looking at the early career of, of who this is, and if we have this information, how is it that Pius XII did not have this information? And he put him in that position. So, we'll see the one thing that will rapidly become clear, and that is that Roncalli was in with the leftists in everything from the very start. Uh, from just about when he started his minor seminary training at age 11, he was in with the leftists. So in a way, he was a victim, uh, it's a truly a case of being scandalized in that sense, being led into involvement in evil things. Uh, but even, even in the case of those who, who sin because they are led into it, still sin. And no, no, nobody can force the will, but no, nobody... However evil an example he might give can ever force anyone else to sin. The devil himself cannot force anybody to sin. He can, he can provide uh, su seductions, he can provide temptations, but he cannot force the will to sin. So, in certain ways, uh, those who are led into sin by someone else are victims in a way, but they also and they, they, they choose sin willingly. Uh, nonetheless. So when we're looking at all this, we say that Roncalli is, is in a way a victim. It's true. You can make an argument to that effect. But he also did plenty of uh, victimizing himself and being the one who called Vatican II. Remember, the, the author of the, the definitive, what is widely seen as the definitive biography of John the XXIII, um, is himself a victim of Roncalli. Uh, someone who apostatized from the priesthood in the wake of Vatican II, along with many thousands of others. He was not the only instance of uh, priests apostatizing uh, in the wake of Vatican II. So, and with leftists from the very beginning, we see this, um, uh, uh, leftists in every way, political, ecclesiastical, everything. If there's a leftist, uh, he was aligned with that leftist. Uh, see that? Yeah, remember, he was chosen as the one who would be the, uh, the, the acceptable candidate to the leftist de Gaulle in, uh, in France, which was being uh, say, taken over by leftists. Uh, that is to say that the, the government of Philippe Pétain was fairly conservative. Fairly conservative. Yes, they, they, had to, they were collaborators, or at least that, that is the... That is, that is how it was perceived at the time, that is how it is perceived to this day. Collaborators with the Nazis, who, let us not forget, were themselves leftists. Uh, but that was really a case of having no other choice. So, definitely, that was co quite conservative. The Vichy regime was quite conservative compared to the Gaulle's government. No question whatsoever. So, Roncalli is the, the candidate chosen to be the one who is pleasing to a new leftist government coming into liberated France, liberated from Nazi-controlled German occupation, uh, in part, anyway, German occupation. But also he was among the, uh, the ecclesiastical leftists, the modernists as well. And we'll see that this is true and across his entire career. He always favored leftism. He was always a, a radical member uh, with a certain veneer of piety and conservatism to him. Remember, he was conservative in everything except the essential. <laughs> Always remember that. Whenever you study John the Twenty Third, remember that. And whatever whatever aspects of piety there might be to him, it's just a cover up. It's a front, so to speak, for his his radicalness, for his his revolutionary inclinations, and uh, indeed the revolutionary agenda which he never failed to push. And even even by even through devious means, which we'll see. 
So, remember his friend was uh, Don uh, Ernesto Bonayuti, from whom he said that he learned much. Well, you know, clearly, uh, Roncalli had a, a faulty memory whenever it was convenient that it be faulty, and uh, said that he never learned anything. He talk, never talked about, say, theology with, with Don Ernesto. But then later on, said after his own election, that he learned much from Don Ernesto. So, which is it? Also, he claimed later on, uh, that uh, that the idea to call Vatican II was something that, that with which the Holy Ghost just inspired him in the moment, and so he decided to call a council, which is not true. I guess he forgot about all the discussions he had previously, and all the he forgot completely when it was convenient for the about the long time during which he considered doing just that. And so a faulty memory whenever it's convenient. Uh, so the vice rector of the seminary, a member of uh, Bergamo. Uh, declines the invitation to be uh, Don uh, Angelo's assistant priest at his ordination. So it's Don Ernesto Bonaiuti who assists him during the ordination ceremony. So then we, uh, we have the question here, could that have been by accident? What was this much that Roncalli admitted to having received from Don Ernesto? And that will harken back here to what we saw um, St. Pius X saying about the Sion. Yeah, we looked at several excerpts from Notre Charge Apostolique in which St. Pius X, in the August 1910 encyclical, condemns various ideas of the Sion. Right? He lays them out and succinctly and condemns them uh, uh, unreservedly. Just, uh, all of this is condemned, uh, condemns it very clearly. Lays it out, clearly condemns it with equal clarity. Though we didn't look at every single word that he says about it, uh, we will look at uh, uh, an additional quotation from it here, uh, taken from Father Ricosa's uh, series, Pope of the Council, uh, that on August 25th, 1910, St. Pius X declared, all the members of the Sion, such as it is, work only for a sect. The Sion, the eye fixed on a chimera, conveys socialism, so a chimera, something, something fleeting, something passing. It is a miserable tributary of a great movement of apostasy organized to establish everywhere a universal church that will have neither dogma nor hierarchy, and which, under pretext of liberty and human dignity, will bring about in the world the legal reign of delusion. So that is the end for which the Sion works. Uh, and this description here of what their ultimate end is, is the exact same end as that of modernism. This is why we talk about this sociological branch of modernism. You have um, uh, philosophical and theological modernism, but also sociological, that actually implements the principles of modernism in society, rather than uh, confining it to the, the realms of the speculative. Of course, uh, ideas do indeed have consequences in the practical order, and these are the practical consequences of modernism in society in general. So, this uh, remember uh, that the end of modernism is ultimately to bring about this dogmaless humanitarian religion. Dogmaless humanitarianism. All everybody will come together on the basis of, of just being nice and providing for people's material needs, putting all questions of dogma and things like that. Forget about all that. That's, that's unimportant. We don't need that. Don't worry about that. That's all it's secondary at best. You know, not maintain certain attachments to those things if you like, but you know, don't don't make that an issue. Just don't worry about that. So this is the. Uh, really, the, the, the religion of the reign of the Antichrist, ultimately, is what we're looking at. And that is what the Sion is working towards, a universal church that has neither dogma nor hierarchy. And uh, also, this being the, the end of the, 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 the goal of modernism, ultimately, remember that the term modernist is not something that really ought to be uh, confined only to those who go by the name Catholic. Then, in fact, Vatican II was the effort of the modernists, of those going by, uh, Catholics going by that name, or, or falling into that category, although they rejected the name, certainly, by that point. 
the, the effort of supposed Catholics to uh, bring the Catholic Church into conformity with this dogmaless humanitarian religion. Remember that the ideas of, of this, this idea of a dogmaless humanitarianism had been around for a long time. Um, uh, we, could, we saw the history of that last year, but that this was not something that originated in, in the 1960s. Um, in the 1860s is when uh, there began to be organized, concerted efforts to bring this about. Yeah, the 1860s. And that uh, every religion, every false religion, had its type of Vatican II, resulting in a split between liberals and conservatives. So you have that, you know, among the Jews, you have the, the more conservative Jews, and then the, the liberal reform Jews. Uh, among Protestants, you have the conservative Protestants and the liberal Protestants. And then as a result of Vatican II, well, that's what we have in front of us today. So that is the, the effort, that is the work of the Sion to bring about this dogmaless humanitarian religion. So what does Roncalli, so clearly St. Pius X condemned that movement and its ideologies. But what does Roncalli think of the Sion? At the death of Marc Sagnier, a member who founded the Sion, the Nuncio Roncalli wrote the following eloquent letter to Sagnier's widow, uh, in Paris, uh, June 6th, 1950, Madame, I heard Max Sagnier speak for the first time in Rome around 1903 or 1907 at a meeting of Jeunesse Catholique, so Catholic youth. So this is uh, something clearly uh, he remembers vividly, almost uh, well, 50 years later, 40 or 50 years later, he remembers this clearly. The fascinating power of his words of his mind ravished me, and I keep of his person and of his political and social activity the most vivid memory of all my priestly youth." So he was clearly revolutionary. He, Roncalli, was clearly revolutionary and leftist from the earliest days of his priesthood. His, uh, Sagnier's, noble and great humility and accepting, later in 1910, the still very affectionate and friendly, known as the Sikh there, admonition of Pope St. Pius X gives to my eyes the measure of his true greatness. So we have a, a Sikh in a position like that. Uh, that's uh, in brackets, meaning that it's been inserted by someone who's quoting this to mean, this is just how I found this quotation. It doesn't make any sense. It might have a Sikh for any number of reasons. Uh, one might be just a grammatical error or a misspelling, something like that, in other words, the, uh, the person copying the quote makes it clear that this is, this is not my mistake. I actually did my job of proofreading. <laughs> this right here is a mistake of the original author, and I'm not altering what he said in any way, not even by way of correcting spelling mistakes, in order to demonstrate that I'm giving you exactly what I found. Right? Or it might be that the statement itself makes no sense. And here, uh, affectionate and friendly admonition of St. Pius X, if he's referring to notre charge apostolique, that's more like a thunder and condemnation, <laughs> which is what it deserved. Uh, it, yeah, not to say that St. Pius X had no use for, for uh, friendly but paternal admonitions. He tried that, as he himself states, for example, in Tashendi, that we've, uh, we've tried everything. We've tried being nice. We've tried all of the uh, easy approaches, so to speak. We've tried, uh, we've, given, we've given the modernists every, every opportunity of reconciling with the church and with the faith uh, without condemning them. Uh, that is, well, not, not to say that their ideas will be left uncondemned, but without launching into disciplinary measures against them. Whereas now, clearly that hasn't worked. The time for diplomacy is over. Now we just have to come crashing down on it, unfortunately. So it has proven to be necessary, unfortunately, but it is indeed necessary, so that's what we're doing. So clearly, St. Pius X had decided that, not by 1910, to crack down also on the sociological wing of modernism, as we might call it, uh, just as hard. And uh, so, uh, yeah, but this is, uh, this is Roncalli. Uh, this, is, this is how Roncalli looked at things. Oh, he's St. Pius X, he's getting a little worked up. He just means to be affectionate and friendly, even if he, he got a little bit severe, you know, got, got, got a little, little, too, uh, little, little too into this. 
but it was still still basically affectionate and friendly. Right? Even though Saint Pius X did not have a, an emotional side to him, uh, and certainly not in a way. I mean, I mean he's also a normal normal human being, and and of course a saint. So it's not to say that he was anyway abnormal, but. Uh, he, his, he did not let any kind of emotion get in the way of what he knew to be necessary. So many people, uh, you can see that in many prominent historical figures, uh, even when, in retrospect, what they should have done in any given situation was abundantly clear. In retrospect, to an objective observer, this is what he should have done. Many people have failed to do what was obviously necessary due to some emotional consideration. Emotions get in the way. You know, St. Pius X had none of that. Uh, so, this is, at this point, he realized this is necessary. The, the, the urgency of bringing modernism down, of, of, of suppressing this problem, this very grave problem, uh, that must take first place. That urgency goes past any kind of other consideration that some people's feelings might get hurt by this. And we tried to spare people's feelings, and that didn't work. Now, severity is necessary. However much, uh, however unpleasant that is for everybody, most of all the one who has to inflict the severity uh, that is necessary. So, souls like his, I'm right here talking, this is Roncalli again talking about Sanye, souls like his, capable of thus remaining faithful and respectful to the gospel and to the Holy Church, are made for the highest ascents which assure glory here below in the opinion of his contemporaries. And of, a and of a posterity to whom Marc Sangnier will remain as a lesson and an encouragement. So, never mind the fact that it was actually condemned in St. Pius X encyclical. This is something that is a lesson and an encouragement of a, of a glorious posterity. On the occasion of his death, my spirit finds itself very comforted in declaring that the voices most authorized to speak in the name of official France are met together unanimously to drape Marc Sagnier as with a mantle of honor with the Sermon on the Mount. One cannot render homage and eulogy more eloquent to the memory of this distinguished Frenchman in whom his contemporaries appreciated the clarity of his profoundly Christian soul and the noble sincerity of his heart. So, uh, gushing and goopy as that is, uh, much worse <laughs> the fact that he uh, you know, clearly likes this l condemned leftism. Clearly. No, not, not just liking it, that's, little, that's, that's an understatement. Um, There's absolutely, as he says, ravished by it, swept up and just uh, transported into some kind of bliss by it. Never mind that it's a, you know, a uh, as Father Acosta points out, um, a sect of miser uh, uh, a sect, a miserable tributary of a great movement of apostasy, and that this is the most vivid memory of the priestly youth of Roncalli, the teaching of that sect of that miserable tributary of apostasy. That's Roncalli. So returning to the month of August 1904, I'm rewinding again, uh, Roncalli was a priest and St. Pius X had been pope for a year. And Roncalli's biographer writes, in 1904, St. Pius X, again, he only says Pius X, showing his colors, uh, dissolved the Opera dei Congressi, which was a harsh blow for Count Giovanni Crosoli, or Crosoli, its last president, and the hardest moment in the life of his chaplain, Rodini Tedeschi. Angelo Roncalli will later say that it was like a clap of thunder in a blue sky. So social doctrine, you know, this was, an, uh, this was part of that. We'll see St. Pius X sees this as part of the general soci uh, sociological modernism, or uh, 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 too, too far caught up in it anyway to be saved. That has to be shut down. Social doctrine did not interest Pius X, says the biographer, leaving off the title saint, and he had only contempt for democracy, Christian or not. See his encyclical, Vehementer, which, remember, Vehementer uh, was the encyclical in which he condemned St. Pius X, with, actually, uh, with the assistance of uh, Pacelli, uh, uh, composed with his assistance, uh, the encyclical in which St. Pius X condemned the unilateral abrogation 
of the of the concordat with France, the French abrogation of that concordat. Yes. Excuse me, Father. What does opera de congressi mean in Italian? Uh, work of the Congress. So it's yes, it was a, uh, a, 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 it was a sociological movement, definitely, which Saint Pius X saw as being too dangerous to allow to continue. So he he had it shut down. So we haven't gone into all the details of that. There are all these all of these social movements going on in Italy at the time, uh, but yeah, it means work of the Congress. Uh, so the, um, or perhaps congresses, I'd have to check the Italian word, but uh, in any case, um, the Opera Dei Congressi was in his eyes a social expression of modernism, as the, the eyes of St. Pius X. So that had to disappear. And with it, Rodini Tedeschi, another Leo XIII man, had to go as well. So Bishop Guindani of Bergamo died in October 1904, and we saw how bad he was. Rodini Tedeschi was named to succeed him. So, now we we'll have to look at Rodini Tedeschi, uh, concerning whom Roncalli wrote a book called My Bishop. So it really looked up someone, a man to whom he, he very much looked up, and whom he saw very much as his, as his mentor, yeah, in many ways. So of a noble family, should be from Piacenza, uh, Rodini, Bishop Rodini Tedeschi was a protege of Rampola. So, we'll see a few, few details of, about Rampola here shortly. Rodini Tedeschi was a protege of Rampola, who named him chaplain of the Society of Mary Immaculate. So, Angelo is naturally attracted to the society of which Rodini Tedeschi is the soul and the animator. There were long evenings passed in his company. This valiant group of Romans, this is what uh, uh, Roncalli's biographer says. Uh, we conversed, or this is actually in a work quoted by him as well. Uh, we conversed with warmth and gaiety, so very uh, lively, lively social gatherings. Or more often, we were occupied with the hard work that he encouraged us to undertake by voice and by example for the success of diverse projects which he directed with such competence. So this is yeah, quoted by uh, the, the author of the biography of, of John XXIII, but this is a quote from you know, Bishop Giacomo Maria, Redi, uh, Maria Redini Tedeschi, Bishop of Bergamo, by Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli himself. So hence, Redini followed the line of the Cardinal Secretary of State of Leo XIII, Rampola del Tindaro, the fomenter of the politics of rallying French Catholics to the Masonic Third Republic. So, uh, remember we saw that last year, at the beginning of the year, the, during the reign of, uh, studying the reign of Leo XIII, we can think back to the time of chaos, of, of moving here and everything. It was around that time that we, we looked at that. And uh, the policy, remember, uh, the Chalimont, uh, which was the, the program of Leo XIII, uh, which, uh, the idea, the central idea of which was that Catholics in France should give up their aspirations of reviving the French Catholic monarchy and uh, instead should rally to, hence the name Chalimont, and anybody who went along with it was known as a Chalier, uh, that they should uh, uh, join forces with the moderates uh, of the Third Republic and uh, thereby uh, uh, forge an alliance to make a situation for the church that was as agreeable as possible. So remember, in that time here, what we're looking at uh, during the reign of Leo XIII, that's in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, it's prior, it's in between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War, so it was a, a very, very busy period in many ways. And one of the ways in which it was busy was uh, France was undergoing all of the trials and tribulations, especially the church in France, of the Third Republic. We saw all the laws uh, that, the, that the Third Republic passed, giving all kind, the church all kinds of trouble in various different ways, uh, kicking out religious orders, uh, taking over schools that had been Catholic schools uh, run by religious orders, and all of that. Uh, this is in, in the uh, late 19th century, uh, after the fall of Emperor Napoleon III. And Napoleon III was himself a, 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 a mason and a carbonarist. He was no prize by any means. 
Uh, he was born apart. He was, he was a, a nephew of the big Napoleon Bonaparte, but there, there, there never was a Napoleon II, but Napoleon III himself was, uh, his reign anyway, was favorable to the church, at least in France. And he was involved in all of the, uh, in all of the revolutionary goings on in Italy. Uh, he was, at the very least, he did nothing to oppose it and was, and was guilty to a degree in that respect. Uh, uh, but in France, at least, his reign was favorable to the church. Uh, no, uh, due to the influence of his wife, the Empress U Eugenie, who was a pious Catholic, uh, he himself was not so much, but his wife was, and uh, as a result, his reign was favorable to the church. Uh, and all of the people who caused the trouble for the church in the years of the Third Republic were people, or at least who started it, they got things started, and caused all that trouble in the immediate aftermath of Napoleon III's disappearance from the scene, were all people who were there under Napoleon III already, but they were, uh, they, they were held back. They were not permitted to push what they wanted to push, clearly, and that the fact that they wanted to push it was made clear by the, by the fact that they did, once they were in a position to do so, but they were held back from that by Napoleon III himself, who uh, was inclined, yet yeah, due to the influence of his wife, was inclined to be, in fact, favorable to the church. And so uh, Napoleon III was gone, so France had just lost a monarch, an emperor, the title was emperor. So it's one thing to keep in mind is that uh, since the revolution, France has had uh, a great many different forms of government. They have had, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the republic, just one right after the other. Uh, and uh, for a little while, even Napoleon Bonaparte himself, the, the, the Napoleon the I, nobody ever calls him that, but for our purposes here, just in order to keep things clear, Napoleon the First Bonaparte, the one who the easily the greatest military genius of all time, that one, uh, even for a little while before he became emperor of France, before he declared France an empire and uh, dragged practically Pope Pius VII to Paris to crown him there, uh, he was uh, already the ruler of France effectively as the first consul, a uh, military dictator, first consul. Uh, so the revolution went through all kinds of different forms of government, had, a, had a, this and that and a directory and all kinds of different things that came and went. Uh, then an empire, the first empire under Napoleon, and then that disappeared. And then in the time of the Restoration, the Bourbon monarchy was brought back, and then that went away again. And you have you know, again the uh, second empire uh, under Napoleon III, and then you have that fell, and then that was after Napoleon III, the Third Republic was introduced. That's Republic number three. Now they're on number five, just to put things into perspective. And number three was toppled by the Nazis in 1940, and since then they went through num they've gone through number four as well. Now they're on number five. Uh, so they're, it's since, again, since the revolution, since they chopped off the head of Louis XVI, it's been chaos to a great extent, not say every single year. Uh, there's been a new government that's come in in the midst of revolution, but it's been general chaos. Certainly compared to what came before, general chaos as far as the government of France is concerned. And at certain times, general chaos in the nation, for sure, during the time of the revolution itself. But this Rachelimont was what came about as a result of the policies pushed by Leo XIII himself uh, on Catholics who have the idea that, well, now Napoleon III is gone, now we have a chance to bring back a Catholic monarchy. And Napoleon III was of the Bonapartist line. And Napoleon himself, Napoleon I, you know, for lack of, a, of an easier way to make, to, to distinguish the two of them, was himself a man of revolution. Absolutely. So what, one thing that becomes clear from that is actually the fact that it was not with a monarchy that the revolutionaries had a problem, the French revolutionaries anyway, did not have a problem with monarchy in principle, they just wanted a revolutionary monarch. So they, were, they, want, they got rid of Louis XVI because he wasn't revolutionary enough. Uh, he, 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 he gave way, and we made quite a few concessions to, revo to the revolutionaries even before he abdicated, but he wasn't enough. Napoleon was a man of the revolution through and through. And it was okay with the revolutionaries that he become emperor because he was a man of the revolution. So, 
he was as, as, as much of a monarch as you could possibly ask for, who just spent the whole, whole of his reign, such as it was, just fighting wars. I can't think of a single, uh, certainly not a prolonged period during which he just sat and ruled France normally. He was just, couldn't help himself, just fighting was all he knew how to do. At least it was all he wanted to do. Uh, and he was extremely good at that, of course, but it was all he wanted to do. Just France was just involved in one war after another, most of which they won up until Napoleon himself was finally defeated and, and ousted. But uh, that was all Napoleon himself did, was fight wars to push the revolution. That was what he did. And Napoleon III was uh, having this very same name and being in, of all the same revolutionary tendencies was not somebody to whom Catholics were too favorable, even if the church fared reasonably well enough under his reign. But after when he's gone, Catholics are thinking, well, this is good in a way. No, they were just as devastated by the defeat of France at the hands of Prussia, at the hands of Bismarck, as much as anybody, as, as anybody in France could possibly have been. But they thought, well, the silver lining to this anyway is that we can bring back a Catholic monarchy now. And there were, the reason that never happened was because there were too many different claimants to, as to who should be the Catholic monarch. Uh, remember the Prince de Chambord refused to, uh, well, they're, 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 one, one claimant wanted, was willing to give way to another, but uh, the, the Prince de Chambord refused to adopt the French tricolor flag. And rightly so. That is a flag of revolution. You know, national flags today are generally symbols of conservatism, but the, in itself, the French tricolor, just as much as the American flag, really is a symbol of revolution in itself. So he refused, the Prince de Chambord refused to, to accept that, and so yeah, no one would cede any claims to anybody else. They couldn't decide who should be the monarch. So, okay, well, well we have, by default, we have to go with... Um, with a republic, just because we need a government. We need a government, but we can't get a, a Catholic monarch in place, so we'll have to go with a republic, with, which rapidly went very badly off the rails. Remember, it started out okay under, uh, under Maréchal MacMahon. Uh, Patrice MacMahon became the uh, one, of, perhaps you could argue, maybe not the exactly, exactly the first president, but became president. He was himself a good Catholic, but he he resigned at a certain point, and then everything just went sour immediately. Uh, so everything became just completely controlled by the Mas by Freemasons with their um, unfettered Masonic agenda at that point. And uh, Leo the Thirteenth, yeah, being conciliatory in policy as he was, said to Catholics, "Yes, this is a horrible government, but rally to it to the extent possible." Remember, forge an alliance with the moderates as much as you possibly can. It didn't work. It didn't work. The, the Third Republic was, was horrible to the church throughout its entire existence. It just, it did nothing, ultimately. The only thing it, well, aside from this, the one thing it did do effectively was ensure that there would never be a Catholic monarch of France ever again. That was the thing that it ensured. That uh, Catholics, yeah, d indeed, they, that enough of them anyway abandoned their hopes of ever reestablishing Catholic monarchy that it's, it, nowadays that there's, there's no way. It's just impossible. Even then, even by that time, it had, was rendered effectively impossible. So that really, that, that was a failure. Uh, definitely, Leo XIII's policy in that regard was a failure. So, uh, uh, Rampola was heavily involved in that also, in the Khalimont, in the failed Rallymont. And uh, Radini Tedeschi is right along the same lines. So suspected of being a Mason, Rompola was not elected at the Conclave of 1903, thanks to the veto of Franz Joseph of Austria. Remember, uh, Franz Joseph uh, disliked, happened to dislike Rompola, uh, for reasons that don't really concern us here, but he happened to dislike Rompola, and so exercise in, in, the, in that Conclave, or uh, had, the, had, the, had an Austrian cardinal get up and say, in the, on behalf of the Emperor of Austria, I veto Cardinal Rampola. I forbid that he be elected. And it's debated, and this is something we've talked about before, but it is debated as to whether uh, the Austrian emperor had that privilege. Remember that the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire lasted for almost exactly a thousand years, from the coronation of Charlemagne in the year 800, Christmas Day of the year 800, very famously in Rome, until the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. Easily Napoleon's 
uh, most crushing victory over all of his enemies, all combined against him all at once, he crushed all of them. And uh, he himself said, uh, identified that later on as the peak of his power. So I could, I could just dictate terms to anybody at that point. So that in 1805, so actually it's even technically more than a thousand years such as it was, the Holy Roman Empire lasted from 800 to 1805. Uh, Napoleon dissolved it at that point and replaced it with the Confederation of the Rhine. Now, in reality, to a very great extent, and we're, we're seeing uh, instances of the extent to which this was true in the reading uh, we're having, and uh, we have a table currently, the Holy Roman Empire was to, great, to a great extent a confederation always, which is to say a, 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 a relatively loose collection of states theoretically presided over by the emperor whose power was in fact limited in practice uh, he could not do as much even as he himself would have liked to do. And so that these little, these, uh, these lower ranking nobles effectively thwarting the emperor's plans to bring, for example, Martin Luther uh, to heal. That was an example of the fact to it, uh, of the extent to which that emperor, the empire was really a confederation of smaller states that uh, those, those lower ranking nobles could effectively just defy the emperor when their agenda was contrary to his. Uh, so it was a, a relatively loose thing anyway, but Napoleon officially got rid of it at that point and replaced it with the Confederation of the Rhine, which was in his back pocket. Yeah, that's what Napoleon did. Uh, he extended French influence very greatly by uh, just uh, forging alliances with, smaller, with other states, with confederations that he set up, that who, all of whom were his allies. That, that was how he extended uh, French influence to very greatly. So, uh, in 1903, the, uh, there is no longer any Holy Roman Emperor who had the power to veto certain candidates. Um, and, uh, and, but at the same time, in 1805, when the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved, certain privileges of the Holy Roman Emperor, certain privileges that had belonged to the Holy Roman Emperor, were transferred to the Austrian Emperor. So the Austrian Emperors were seen as the successors of the Holy Roman Emperors, one of whose privileges uh, was to, uh, one, of, uh, one of whose powers was that of veto in a papal conclave. So Franz Joseph, just a quick recap on that, Franz Joseph exercises that, and it was it was not conceded by all that he actually had that power, though it seems more likely that he did, in fact, to whatever extent that, uh, whatever, to whatever effect that has, it seems that he probably did, but in any case, that's another question. Certainly not anymore. Remember, St. Pius X got rid of that. He clearly revoked that. If there was any such power, it is now revoked. He made that clear. But Rampola was not elected because of that. It looked as though Rampola was going to be elected. Remember, we, we looked at that last year. The numbers of the, on the different ballots in the conclave, which were pub was all public at the time, it was all public. So we have all those numbers. It really looked as though Rampola was going to be elected. Then he got, he got vetoed, and then the votes went to Cardinal Sarto instead. There were still some votes given to Rampola, but uh, even a, a, a veto with any kind of plausibility, even if, even if it is somewhat doubtful, is as good as one that is certainly valid. <laughs> In the sense that nobody will, no cardinal in a conclave will vote for a cardinal on whom there is even the least shadow of plausible doubt as to the legality of electing that cardinal. So, in other words, we don't want to bring about another great Western schism situation by electing a pope uh, who, you know, in itself, uh, even if the cardinals just completely disregard all the rules of the conclave, a conclave can still produce a validly elected pope. At the end of the day, uh, if the whole church ultimately accepts him, then you have universal peaceful acceptance, which is a whole, it's a very interesting thing to consider all on its own, abstracting from any era of history. But uh, the point is that uh, even though that can happen, uh, still, if it's public, when the conclave is public, and there's some kind of veto exercised, uh, nobody will vote for a cardinal, uh, 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 concerning whom, should he be elected pope, people might be able to say, oh, his election was invalid because of that veto. Therefore, we'll go and elect somebody else. Then you have a, multiple claimants to the papacy, you have different nations aligning themselves with different claimants, you have the great Western system all over again, potentially. Nobody wants that. <laughs> so they will never vote 
far after that, Cardinal Rampolla it might as well have just died as far as his election to the papacy. <laughs> Uh, he was never going to be elected after that. So, uh, those, uh, so then the cardinals, the electors, started switching their votes to Cardinal Sarto, who was ultimately elected. So it was St. Pius X instead who was elected, and he named, named Mary Delval Secretary of State instead of Radini Tedeschi. So just looking at this, we'll look more clear, or closely at Radini Tedeschi, but if you'd had that, if you'd had Rampolla becoming Pope, and Rodini Tedeschi as his Secretary of State, Vatican II would probably have started in 1932 instead of 1962. I mean, if you look at, every, at the development of modernism and the extent to which it was manifesting itself even uh, arguably during the reign of Leo XIII, uh, it's shocking that Vatican II happened as late as it did. The only thing that makes any sense to explain how late, uh, the, the lateness with which it finally did occur was that the reign of St. Pius X, that St. Pius X himself, and all the efforts that he spearheaded in, uh, in bringing down modernism, uh, that that was the only thing that stunted its progress, if you want to call it that, enough to, to delay it to the 1960s. You know, things were heading quickly in that direction. All of the, the, the uh, you had the, the Americanism that manifested itself during the reign of Leo XIII. Uh, they had the uh, shocking and scandalous ecumenical Congress of Religions in Chicago in 1893. Uh, looking at that, it's like, how, did, how is it that Vatican II only began about 70 years later? It seems that it would just be, you'd expect it to come 20, 30 years later at the latest. So Vatican II would probably have happened much sooner where it had it not been for the reign of St. Pius X. So, Virginia Tedeschi, that didn't happen. He did not become Secretary of State. Uh, Rumpolder would probably have named him that, but he, of course, Rumpolder was not elected. The Episcopal government of Virginia Tedeschi began with the collaboration of Don Angelo Roncalli, who wrote, his burning eloquence, his innumerable projects, and his extraordinary personal activity could have given the impression to many at the beginning, that he had in view the most radical changes and that he was moved by the sole desire to innovate. Contrast that with the statement of St. Pius X, far from the clergy be the love of novelty. Virginia Tedeschi, in the words of Roncalli, his great admirer, his protege and his admirer, he, was, he, uh, uh, he gave the impression to many at the beginning that he had in view the most radical changes and that he was moved by the sole desire to innovate. At the very, very least, an absolutely horrible impression to make, if nothing else. The absolute worst impression he could have made. So Roncalli's biographer posits the question, was this first impression false? Again, Roncalli just says this is an impression, implying that yeah, at the very least, not conceding that is actually the case, just saying this is the impression that he gave. Then he, the biographer, uh, then answer is yes and no. And he, Roncalli, explained, he concerned himself le less with carrying out reforms than with maintaining the glorious tradition of his diocese and with interpreting them in harmony with new conditions and the new needs of the times. I'm not sure that you could get a better description of modernism than that. That they don't that they 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 don't get rid of anything. So they say, they they uh, keep keep everything in place. Yes, we're just we're going to transform the Catholic Church. That was their idea. Yes, everything in uh, in harmony with what has come before. That is the bam, That is the assertion of the Novus Ordo hierarchy to this day uh, concerning Vatican II. That there's no substantial rupture, at least of Novus Ordo conservatives. That is no substantial rupture with the past. So really, those Novus Ordo conservatives are doing, are very, very much at the service of, of, uh, of modernism. Now, they are really, ultimately, if you look at it closely enough, those Novus sort of conservatives are modernists using modernism to try to fight modernism. That's what they're doing, ultimately. <coughs> and this is their idea. Yes, we're not going to get rid of anything. We're going to keep it all, keep the glorious tradition of the church. Uh, we're just going to transform the church from within. So they'll, they'll, they'll keep a certain shell a certain shell. I mean, it's, it's, it's more becoming more and more and more obvious with time that it's nothing more than a shell that they're maintaining. But a certain shell of uh, trying to maintain some, 
some pretense of, con of continuity with the past, but uh, changing everything to meet new conditions and the new needs of the times. And that's, that's how Roncalli himself described Vatican II, or opening up the, the windows of the church and letting in some fresh air. That was his idea. So, uh, this is where clearly uh, Roncalli comes under his influence and uh, it would always act in accordance with his, with Redini Tedeschi's way of doing things. And uh, modernists, even during the reign of St. Pius X, did that. You know, there were some who have said, well, yes, we, we, can, we, can, we can sign to certain professions of faith with, with which they did not actually agree, but we can do that because the hierarchy of the church cannot change the meaning of the words, and we understand this correctly. Yeah, keeping the shell of things, but altering the substance. Altering the substance. So Father Ricosa writes, Such would likewise be the ambition of Roncalli himself, when he became Pope, quote-unquote, more than 40 years later, that which he would express in similar terms, the revivification of tradition by adornamento, updating. That was Roncalli's idea. Not changing anything, just updating the substance, that's all. That's it, just, just updating. That sounds nice, adornamento, just updating. Uh, so, actually, Father Rocosa doesn't actually put the quotations around the word Pope, just, just leaves that there. But uh, we put that in because and we can see clearly, uh, we, we'll get into that later, uh, that, um, if we have the time, the, the argument uh, of, of his intention, of the defect of intention on part of Roncalli, because of which he could not receive uh, the papal authority. So the Bishop of Bergamo, that's uh, Rodini Tedeschi, would go on to merit the reputation of being a red bishop by supporting the strike of the League of Workers at, uh, uh, at Ranica in September 1909. So a uh, red bishop, you know, red meaning reference to revolution. It's, that is what is known as an arbitrary sign, which I may have described earlier. But an arbitrary sign, something which is, uh, is a sign of something because men have decided that there's a connection that this thing is a sign of this, as opposed to an instrumental sign, such as smoke being a sign of fire. Where there is, where there is smoke, there must be fire, necessarily. You cannot have, you cannot have smoke without fire. That's one of those. Therefore, smoke is a, is a sign of fire. This is a sign in a different way that uh, uh, red in itself, um, the church uses red as, as, a, uh, uh, as the color of vestments on certain days to, to symbolize the blood of the martyrs or, or the fire of the Holy Ghost. But it can also be uh, red, the color red has also now become associated in a different context with revolution. So the, uh, this became, uh, uh, go into the whole history of that, but uh, with the, I suppose uh, nowadays it is a bit interesting that the relatively conservative political party in the U.S., the Republican Party should have red as its color, which is, that is a bit of a, uh, a departure from that general trend. But uh, red, in general, in a political setting, means revolution. And in this country, uh, it means it's come to mean the opposite. But yeah, it just goes to show that that is a, an, um, an arbitrary sign. But Interestingly here, he became known as a red bishop, a revolutionary bishop, somebody in conformity with all of that, and indeed pushing and supporting it, by supporting the strike of the League of Workers in September 1909 in this particular town. So it's, uh, uh, well, we'll get into that next time, but uh, we'll, we'll explain uh, some, at least some of the morality of such things, of strikes, and, um, uh, well, also look at what is called a uh, Christian Unionism next time.